how the, what was the different systems and stuff that he put in place uh, to be successful. So uh, it's very excited to have him here. Everybody give it up for Dytron. Yeah. And uh, I think she already started recording. Okay, good. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's try to put this in here. Uh, give a little bit more about myself. Uh, I moved to Chicago in 2014, technically. I um, decided yeah, I decided that it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> I decided that Chicago, I, I moved to Naperville, first thing. Moved from England to, to Naperville, thinking that Naperville was close enough to the city that you could do anything. You quickly realize that that's not the case. Um, so I basically packed up everything and I moved to Bucktown. And during that time, I kind of just decided to travel for a year. So I traveled around the world, talked to Bug, 15, 15 countries in 24 months, in 12 months. It was quite a crazy, crazy trip. But then I came back, um, broke, as you would imagine. Um, and now I'm in Bucktown and very expensive rent. So now I'm sitting there with like a $2,000 rent. And I'm like, I can't pay this myself. Um, still in school. So I would start grad school at the time. Um, and it's like, I need to figure this out. So I started to just do Airbnb out my second bedroom. Um, I had a two bedroom, two bath, and I just rented out one of the bedrooms, one of the bathrooms, thinking that I could make some money and it, it makes, it makes sense. Um, and whenever I started doing that, I found another person that was looking for someone to help. Um, so I basically helped him Airbnb his place that was a rent by the room. So five five bedroom house and he rented out every single room. Um, so I would help him with his operation there for like a couple of years. Um, so I kept doing that for a while. Um, Chicago's rules got a little bit tougher. Then we basically, I basically moved out of my Bucktown place and then moved around the city a bit until I found a place in Lincoln Park. Me and Emily met each other around the same time. Um, another two bedroom, two baths, and was like, hey, why not rent this out together? It's rent out a second bedroom while we're here together. And she said yes, reluctantly said yes. So now we have Airbnb guests walking past the living room where we're sitting on the couch. It's kind of weird, but come to find out it was like I was it was paying 75% of my, my rent. So I'm like, this is great. So I, I me and her split a four hundred dollars per month for the rent. And the rest of it was coming from Airbnb guests. And you get like four per month, and it's like this is amazing. Um, then COVID hit, um, COVID hit and we probably lost maybe 10 to $15,000 of bookings. It's like everything just went down the tank. And so it's like, we should buy something. We, we talk about it. We want to do it. I had a VA loan at the time. So why not buy something? Um, so we started to buy, um, we, we bought, um, in Lakeview and we were, we were supposed to move in, do all these things because we wanted it for ourselves and then decided like, yeah, maybe not um we want to travel world yet again and we just kind of start airbnb and out that and then it kind of kept snowballing from there um so basically we started purchasing in chicago then kept on going and it's like why not purchase in mexico and every other state possible so that's how we got started um at this point now we we're up to to seven places five of them being online, two of them still up and running, uh, up and coming, but we're trying to double that number by by next year. And if not, triple that, which is crazy. <laughs> oh, go a little bit. So I want everyone to see some of the, the industry because the numbers have shifted quite a bit for short-term rentals over the last few months, few years, especially with COVID. Um, so I, I get this chart is from 20, 2011 through 20, uh, 2021 through 2020, uh, 2023. So basically COVID numbers that makes, it's like everyone started to jump into the game as soon as it started to happen. Um, as you can see, uh, this is the occupancy numbers. So a generally nice occupancy that you would wanna have is like 70% to 80%. 100% occupancy means that you're probably price wrong. Um, and if you, people think it's a steal in a book and if you had a hundred, you sh your range should be a little bit lower than that. So you need to move your prices up, but you start to see that the numbers started to go crazy over the years. And so 2021 was, was a great year. 2022 was amazing for everyone. That's when everyone started to jump in the market. Um, and short-term rentals become a, a real conversation for most. Um, and as of this year, we are trailing down and everyone's starting to freak out now. Um, it's like, is this going to work or is it not going to work? 
Um, and a lot of people bought with the notion that it was and their rents and their mortgages are at short-term rental rates and they're not meeting expectations. So a lot of people are freaking out. So definitely wanted to to bring this up. And on the next slide, I did bring in the um, short-term rental average daily rates. It just like the um, the occupancy rates, those are dropping also. So last year, you could rent a place out that was a two bedroom piece of crap and you can rent it out for $500 a night in Chicago. It's, it was just insane. So those numbers are starting to slide back down. So this year we're, we're trending downward and we will keep trending downward from, by the end of the year. So if you were making great money um, last year and you benchmarked off that year, um, it's quite possible that you're going to end up on the downside. Um, so a lot of people didn't take that into account when they started to buy their Airbnb. So um, hope they got to check it, a second option. Um, with that being said, um, I wanted to talk more about choosing the market because of this. Um, the places that got hit hard are the big, the big vacation places, the Orlando's um, or and the Disney World. So Disney World or somewhere in California, Joshua Tree were one of the bigger places. They got hit hard. Um, so when people start to think about when you, where do you put your Airbnb, it's just more the fact of what person are you trying to rent it to? Um, like a vacation spot, it's like the Disney Worlds where people are taking a flight, they're traveling, they're taking time off from work and they're going to see your place. Um, an urban traveler, it's like someone coming to Chicago for the weekend, they're not on they're not on holiday, they're here for work, they're here for a, a concert of, of some sort and they're just here for three to four days. Um, and the local travel um, stuff, something that's like, you go there with your family, go to the Wisconsin Dells, Cedar Point, Galena. I, I didn't even know what Galena was until like a year ago. Um, no more to think that it's a travel destination spot. Um, but majority of your, your tourists are from Chicago and they are traveling to these places for the weekend. Um, their expectations, the amount of money they're, they're willing to spend is different. Um, and each one of these markets are different. Um, so a short-term rental vacation market in Orlando, those people are spending substantial amount of money. There's there are 10, 15, 20,000 on trips that they're going on. Um, and they have expectations of that their very expensive apartment, an Airbnb, is going to be super nice. So their expectations are saying that if there's marks on the floor, there's something here, there's something not great, they're, you're going to ask for their money back or some side of, of stipend back. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that the type of people you get with these vacation markets makes it harder. Um, but you can still do the same amount of cash flow in the different markets and still remote uh, come out to the same number. You can buy a house in, in Orlando for a half a million dollars and still cash flow $1,500 a month to $2,000 a month. But you can also get a place for the same amount and less headaches in Chicago, if not cheaper. And you can still cash flow $1,500 to $2,000 if for the same month. Um, the same goes for the local travelers. Um, the local travel is the ones, it's like the sweet spots, if you per se. Um, these are smaller cities that people don't generally live as much. They go on vacation there, vacation for the weekend, um, but they don't live there. It's house prices are a little bit cheaper and people are on vacation, so they're still willing to spend a little bit more money. So your your ADR is higher um, and your accuracy is pretty seasonal, but it is still worth it in the end that you can still make it work. Um, so that's what I wanted to point out because everyone has a tendency to like, I want to go to like the most profitable place in their mind at least. And they go to Disney World, they go to Joshua Tree, they go to the Smoky Mountains and they don't realize that every house there is almost a million dollars. So your rent's high and your 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 um revenue is high, but um, stuff to take into account. Um, to give an example, especially of like the people's interests and desires, um, there's a property that I looked at in Orlando, like about a hundred reviews, and it's like a four point seven, which is in Airbnb world is pretty bad. Um, but it's amazing. It's a beautiful place, it's one of the best places you can think of. But they got dinged on something not being professional, something not being exactly perfect. But you have a property that's in urban Chicago, and it's not as nice, but it has a four point nine two because the clientele that's coming into the place, their expectations are different. So they're not caring about that you didn't leave coffee out and you didn't have a pizza in the freezer for them as an amenity. Um, they're more caring about, do we have a bed? Can I sleep here? And can I, can I go out this weekend and party? Um, 
so their their desires are different, which is a huge deal. Um, so I wanted to point that out that if you're looking for a market, don't just look for the market that um that everyone else thinks they should go to. Think about the places that you went when you were in school, where you, when your your parents took you for um for holidays for the weekend because it was a four day weekend. So places like that are some of the good spots you should be looking at. Um, I will say, obviously, I own international. So the international piece is always a little bit of a gamble. Um, if you want to buy international, um, make sure it's a place that you want to go to. So if you want to travel around the world and you want to own in those places in the world, at least make it a tax write-off where I can go to Tulum every year, multiple times a year. And I don't have to worry about, am I spending too much? Because I can write a, a lot of this off just because I'm going to check out my Airbnb. Um, and can go anywhere where we're trying to get properties in Argentina and Ecuador, like in within the year. So those are both markets I love. They're amazing. And I want to go there still meant to be a profitable business. So they're still underwriting as a business, but we're most definitely thinking about it from the aspect that we want to go there. It can make us money, but for the small times that it doesn't make money, it's okay because I get to go enjoy it myself and stay there for two, three weeks. Okay. Uh, challenges. Um, I wanted to make sure I brought this one up because Chicago is a very challenging place to have short-term rentals. Um, I wanted to pick this from the city's website because everyone has a question about how this works. Um, for this is so this is Chicago specifically. Um, if you want a short-term rental in Chicago and it's a single-family house or a a four flat or below, you need to own or occupy the property for the city to approve your lease. Um. So you can't have a four flat that you don't live in and just rent it, rent one of the properties out on Airbnb. Um, with that being said, the city's rules also say that no more than 25% of the building can be used as a short-term rental, upwards of six units, which one what comes first. Um, this year, they decided to change a little bit of the rules because it used to be that a four flat on a, on owner occupied was allowed. Um, but as of this year, that's not anymore. So a four flat and below has to be owner occupied also. So that's the piece that people are getting hung up on since majority of the home houses in Chicago are are um, four flats or below. They're not bigger buildings. Um, but the sweet spot that you really want to look for for a big project is going to be in the five units and above that you can buy it, rent it out, Airbnb out some of the units, and you can still make good cash flow. Um, but if you're like a normal person like us, you have your four flat and you live in one of the units, you can Airbnb out another. Go ahead. How does it not set a red flag up? I see uh, short term rentals on Airbnb all the time in Chicago and like duplexes. And it's not like you know, by the room, it's the entire place. And it's clearly like a full rental. Like, I'm just, isn't that just everybody setting up there? Um, so. The rules are saying that you live in the building. So if you have scenarios in the unit. So what people are doing is that if, if they're anything like us, we travel for a sustained period of time. We're gone for three to four months at a time. And when we're not there, we're renting out our own place. So those scenarios are allowed. So when you're actually renting the place that you own, um, I do have a few friends that they their properties are duplex down. Um, with a separate exit on the duplex on the down. And they basically wall off the separation between the two and they rent out the bottom half. And they, the person at the bottom has their own entrance and exit. They don't have to come in contact with them. It has its own, they set up their own little kitchen, kitchenette scenario so they can actually be on the bottom half. And it's still with it's within the rules. Um, so if, if you go this route, there's different setups. Um, but yes, that is the rule in the city. So that's what makes it complicated. Right. Is there a day limit that you can have it rented out as a primary residence? If a limit, no. No. So, so rent out the entire year. But, but if, if you're a primary residence, so yes. Uh, because once you go over five units, it doesn't even own occupied at that point. So you. So yeah, twenty up twenty up to twenty five percent or six units must come first. So if you own a a twenty four unit building, you're able to rent out six units. That's your cap uh, as an Airbnb, and the rest of the building has to be mid term or long term, um, which is that that works. Um, so obviously the 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 best place that you can possibly get will be a twenty four unit 
and that will give you the max amount of numbers without going over too far. So, so I wanted to make sure that people people understood this aspect of the city's rules. Um, but I do want to put out that managing and short-term rentals are not, it's not simple. When, as soon as you open this up as a hospitality business and you're expected to be a hospitality manager over your business. So when some guests message you at 2 a.m., which we get those messages, um, you can't ignore it until the next day completely. You should have someone, it doesn't have to be you or VA of some sort that is able to, to answer the messages or send out a message saying that I will be available at a certain time. You can't just let it go un, unspoken to for six hours while you wake up to the next day. Um, so, and being able to be flexible. Um, we have amenities in our properties that uh, go above and beyond from the, the coffee to, we actually do have pizzas in our properties. So it's like, if a guest comes in, there's a pizza in the freezer and it's like a have free pizza on us. Um, and it's just a small amenity that's a drunk person coming home from Wrigley, they would love to have a pizza in their house. So you can actually cook a pizza. So small little things. So it, you are in the hospitality industry, um, but you can make very good money, but you have to realize that it's still not long-term. I know if we all used to our long-term rentals and it's nice when I don't get a message from my tenants for six months at a time, but, um, but this person will definitely call you every day, message every day. Um, and from a management standpoint, I tell anyone this. Um, it's not a long-term rental. It's not a, it's just like a long-term renter. You should have software, just like you have software for your long terms. Um, trying to manage an Airbnb without software is almost impossible. You will pull your hair out within the first two weeks because you're working way too hard. Um, so if you're going to do it, make sure that you get the right technology in space because if you don't, you're going to end up missing a, a message if someone inquires for a, a three thousand dollar booking and you ignored them for five hours and they went somewhere else like it hurts when you lose a really big booking uh because of just you decided to not answer in time uh i will we can talk about it offline but if you want to talk about some of the, the um the technology that's needed that i use that should be preferred i can talk about that um or put that in the q a uh do, do, do. With that being said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to make it too long, so I sit here and talk because I'm sure there's gonna be a, a load of questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it seems to me like the research I've done, uh, it seems like Wrigley and Boca Driven owners are the most popular as far as demand. Would you agree with that, or is what, what do you see? Uh, or is it more about our lives? It is demand. Uh, the fact is that we have properties on the west side of the city and in the north side of the city. Our north side is 90 to 95% occupied every, during the summertime. We are doing good numbers on the west side, but it's still nowhere close to the numbers. Like our, our cash flow is like double in, in Lakeview. Oh, yeah. That's fair. Um, and then is it possible at all to you stay away from downtown i mean so you have to be weary about it because there are some hoas in the downtown area that does allow um airbnbs but there's six other people that's already done it so those six people already have the licenses and as long as they keep it going you no one else can get in um but you can buy a condo you just need to do your due diligence on the front end to make sure that that building is allowed to do Airbnb, the HOA allows you to do it, and the cap has not been met at that current time. So, it is definitely it's definitely a possibility. How do you analyze the market for Um, someone gave me this like a couple weeks ago at a conference. Um, first you don't want to look in the biggest the biggest market. So like we like there are some cities out there. That you can make the same amount of cash flow as the, the bigger cities but it's small and not a lot of competition um this guy he was playing around with the notion of if there is a major hotel brand in that city that means the city itself is viable for travel because they've already done their research on it so like without much thought if you see an opportunity somewhere zoom out and see if there's a, a marriott a hilton or uh, ihg branded hotel around if they are, you have a good possibility that they've done their due diligence already 
and you can start to see like, is it a viable area? Go ahead. What software do you use to, uh, I guess, adjust the rental rates for like if there's an event in the area, or do you do that manually? I'm not, don't do it <laughs> manually. Uh, I use Price Labs, but there's Beyond Pricing and and um something will I can't remember the name. It, no, AirDNA is a researching more software, but um this uh, Price Labs actually attaches to your Airbnb account and it will shift your prices with with your consent, obviously, but it shifts your prices on a daily basis. Is it per rental or is it, is it like a membership fee? Uh, it's per rental. Um, I think it's about like twenty dollars a month per unit, but then I think the the farther you scale, the cheaper it becomes. But you have to realize that you don't remember what's going on, or something changes that that pops up. I want to say like just during COVID, uh, Lollapalooza was green lighted at the last minute. They only had like a like two months to do it, and then the day that they green light green lit it, people start booking. And then if you didn't change your pricing, you could have had it for a hundred bucks a night and you should have had it for $700 a night. So you can't keep up with that. So they started to notice the demand and they shift the price for you. Also, it's, it, it does seem aggressive some days because I look at my calendar and I, I use the same example all the time. Random day in October, I didn't know it. It was like $600 a night. I'm like, why 600 bucks? No clue. And then someone books and like, what the hell is going on? And you look it up and it's like the marathon. And it's like, I didn't know. But someone books like a $3,000 booking in October. And it's like, this is insane. That pays my whole mortgage. You can, um, but you do hurt yourself in other aspects. Like we just got a booking maybe last week for January, the time when I was not expecting to get any bookings. And um, the further you book, the further you book out, the more aggressive the pricing is. So we got a week long booking in January for two grand, which is not a thing. Mm -hmm. Like you, you just want to break even in January, not the thought of trying to make cash flow in January. So the closer that they book, usually the cheaper. Yes. Because you want to stay. Basically, it's more about occupancy than anything else. Once get a little close. Doesn't Airbnb adjust their prices as well and put it the platform? They can, but I will tell you that Airbnb is more about getting their fees. They don't care about getting you money. Okay. So they will they will make sure someone's in there, but the price that they put it at will be substantially lower than you should. So those the people that use Airbnb as their software, pricing software, they're the people that have a hundred occupancy. But the fact is that they're they left thousands of dollars on the table because of it. Oh. <laughs> so I know you are really good at sourcing rentals and you help a lot of people and I was looking at you know you help consult as well and you tell everyone about it. <laughs> and I was like, you know, you have, yes. a, you have a tremendous amount of value. Um yeah, I, I didn't say this, so he, he said this. <laughs> I do provide coaching services. So there are people that are trying to figure out how to get into the world of Airbnb. So we have like a, a full one-on-one -on -one coaching week to week with, with tasks um, for you wanting to get into it, want to buy a place, want to arbitrage a place. Uh, we can go through the whole process from finding sourcing to getting up and running and making sure that you're super host by the next three months. Um, we do have advanced courses also. So if you're a person that already knows the market in the world, we um, have a shorter process. It's a little bit more nitty gritty. And like, you need to learn these types of things for Airbnb, but you bought houses for the last 10 years. I don't need to explain to you how to do market research as much if you know how to purchase properties already. Go ahead. Uh, so Tulum, obviously during COVID, ha had a huge boom. Um, we purchased our property in Tulum um, pre-construction. So most people must know that you can't get a, a, a Mexican like mortgage as an American. Um, so the easiest way to go around that is doing through the builder. So we had a new build and the builder carried the debt um, for an extended period of time. So uh, that gave us enough time, enough payments um, to get it built and get it built, financing and all those things. So um, we were able to build there. Um, Tulum clientele 
shifted. It used to be the, the American travel spot because they wanted one place you can go during COVID. Um, but lately, it's been more locals. I get more Mexicans than anything else, um, which is a shift. But um, it's a big boom and is a lot on the market right now. So the, so they're getting very saturated with apartments right now. Um, so there is a company out there that will carry it. Um, their stipulations are high. Their debt to income is really low. So you have to be, as an investor, if you have a couple properties, you probably be pushing their debt to income lines. Um, but basically, you can get a lender that will carry a debt for five years, a balloon at the five years, and um, you pay it that way. So it's amortized over 30 or 20 and, and a balloon after five. So Chris? Touch base a little bit on like the seasonality of the market. Yes. When it comes to analyzing deals relative to the long term, I guess, how do you kind of track the market? Um, that's a good thing because a lot of people don't look at that. Um, a lot of people just look at the, the top line cash flow. You go into Air DNA, it says you're going to make fifty nine thousand dollars a year. You know that you have you have twenty thousand dollars in in mortgages a year, and you think I'm going to make thirty grand. I'm going to make all this money, but you don't realize that in January and February, it's not going to make like you're going to make majority of your money in July. Uh, you're not going to make anything in January. So it's definitely knowing the demand in your area and then seasonalizing that demand that thirty thousand dollars across that time frame. Um, so I, my calculations, my calculator now, basically I pull in Chicago's bell curve and um, it's very skewed to the right. So um, the, the January, February is pretty tough. Um, and just put it in numbers that way. So 10%, 4%, well, 3% of my annual revenue comes in the month of January. And I think three also is in February. So 3% of $30,000 is... A, enough to carry you but it's not enough to make a lot of money but 10 percent of my cash flow comes in july um for the year so you get quite a chunk of money in in the month of july so definitely putting a seasonality piece into it um and if you are buying and renting out of chicago and you're using it as uh, the cash flow needs make sure that you are the first spot enough that you we have so for us we have properties in chicago we know that it's going to be dead in the, in the winter time and we have properties in other states where January, February is their high seasons and it compensates for my low season here in Chicago. Go ahead. They're not. Um, so they've gotten better, but they're generally not that amazing. Like we we benchmarked uh against Air DNA's data and a few years probably like last year, we were probably six months into the year and probably down like six grand off of AirDNA's data for getting the first of the year. So it's not far off, but it's, I mean, 6K in, in seven months is it's not great. Um, so their numbers are high. I don't know why they're so high. Um, from what I'm being told, they're dropping them down and they're pulling in more. They're basically throwing out 22, 22, 2022's data because it's, it's skewed because it had so many travelers. But once you pull that out and pull out those anomalies, it starts to drop down. Um, so at the current moment, it's better than it was, but it's definitely, you should take a good chunk of that off to be like, okay, this this is what's realistic because the numbers that they throw in is insane sometimes. Go ahead. Um, I mean, Chicago Chicago was an appreciation market for me in the first place. That's why I bought here. And I knew that I, if I can hold something that that cash flowed enough and I can hold it for five years, it'd be worth substantially more than I bought it for originally because we do only buy in class A and B neighborhoods. So um, COVID, the COVID growth actually stuck for us, which was great. Um, so we didn't, we dropped off maybe like 2% off to the 20% that we went up. Um, so that was the paper here, but if getting into it, I would say Chicago is not an amazing market to be in. If you have a multifamily here currently, you can make it work, but to start here, it's not as easy. If anything, I would start with an arbitrage unit, honestly, because uh, they those are the five units plus that you five unit plus buildings you can get into that's worth one point five to two million dollars, but you can't buy it yourself. So 
you can arbitrage those. Um, but I would say the arbitrage market is getting pretty tight here too, because there's there's a few companies here that are basically renting out everything. If if you're somewhere you're trying to live in, um, I mean it's research in the area. I would I underwrite anything as a long term rental. Um, but I mean, majority of the neighborhoods, people want to be there that we're going to anyway, uh, especially if you're close to something. I mean, brand example is um, West Town. They now have a casino coming down there. That is <laughs> it's a great idea, but it, the numbers jumped. So it, as a long-term rental, even West Town really doesn't make sense as much as it does it used to anymore um, because of a casino. But as a long-term rental, a short-term rental, it does, but you still got a few years before that's realized. And if you wait, then you're kind of in trouble. Um, but it's definitely underwrite as a long term, use the short term rents at to to boost it way, way higher than you expected. But um, I always underwrite with long term in mind because city has shifted its thoughts on short term rentals a couple of times. So you don't want to get caught with a bag. Um, but definitely like the, the, the neighborhoods, if Rigby Field is like the number one thing here, it's just the party place for people to go to. So that market is not easy to get into. Um, but if anything else, the casino, something close to downtown, close to a line, something close to the airport, um, something that where the the air travel, the travel industry, like the flights, they can re rent out and stuff like that. So there's definitely definitely ideas. Go ahead. Um, can you speak a little bit uh, to your experience with it all regarding your property that have been in markets where you've tried to get saturated? Like how has that affected your vacancy? How has that affected uh, the price of vacancy on the event for those people that maybe have an overall vacancy on the event? So we try to stand out with all of our short-term rentals. Um, you can you can just put a few beds in some place and, and still make money. But where the people are really making the money is that they're creating more of an experience. The place looks like I want to stay there. Um, so putting more money into visuals, that, and that is one of the big things that a lot of people struggle with, is that they are long-term rental focused and they just have a long-term rental. And it's like, I'm going to turn into Airbnb. And it's like, you can do that, but you're more affected with the occupancy issues because your place looks normal. If I have a place that looks like this, if, if I put a place like this on Airbnb, it will rent out a lot easier because you have mirrors on the walls. You have things that are meant to attract travelers and young travelers with the money. Um, so it's definitely the saturation, like your competition is mostly like, harder because they're coming in joshua tree being one of them if you ever look up if you type in joshua tree and airbnb like majority of homes on the first two pages are amazing and i they, they have themed out rooms from from mario brothers on the wall to like having this oasis in the backyard so if you're looking outside of the box and creating something amazing you're not getting hit as hard but if you're just trying to take something that's basic and normal then you might not work so well but with that being said the saturated market that you have to do that with, there's market, the secondary markets that you don't have to do that in because they just don't have Airbnbs in general. Um, I, I know someone, uh, I won't name call him. He basically started like in Orlando, same same scenario where it's hard to make it make sense. And then he ended up buying in Michigan City. So like no, like no one goes to Michigan City that much, but that you think of, but it's workers there. Um, people coming in for work and he he's like double his cash flow of what he would make in Orlando in Michigan City and he's not even have to do much with the places just make them look normal because his competition is so low and he doesn't have to do much um so that goes into one of our other properties. So we do have property in Southwest Michigan. Um, and it's a property that's huge. It's our biggest property ever. Uh, it's a six bedroom, four bathroom house, almost 5,000 square feet. It's huge, but its promotion is to the wedding crowds. So in that side of the world, you got the you got from the dunes all the way up to through the wine area and then up to Benton Harbor, you have all of that areas is 
big for bachelorette parties from Chicago wins, bachelorette parties and wedding venues out there. So we definitely um pushed that market and trying to build a place in that market that uh, like go towards the the people that are coming in for weddings. Yes. Yes. Um it's just the same. I mean, there's not that many people that get married in December in, in Chicago. Um, so it's still the same seasonality that Chicago has. Um, but if you're smart, um, you shift your short-term rentals to midterms during the winter time if you need to. If you feel that your cash flow won't make the numbers that you want to, just flip it for three months to long term to midterm. So I guess I will say that since that book came up. Um if you are having a short-term rental that's not performing, or you if it's in the Chicago market and you know that you're gonna go cash flow negative for January, February, just turn into a midterm. There's gonna be someone out there that wants to stay for three months. Furnish a furnished three-month rental is not that hard. You do have to do your due diligence as a long term, but most most of the people here already know how to do that. Um, so just find someone for three months, put it on Zillow, mm -hmm. and you can get someone pretty easily. Okay. Yeah, both. Oh. Um, so our Avondale property is one of those properties that would be on the the lower side. Lakeview, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, our Lake our Avondale property is like during the winter time, it it does drop off. So we are using the furnace finder to to get someone in. And so you just make it like you just put short term three months. Yeah. So you get your time frame and some people you be surprised at the amount of people that are actually and traveling nurses that use Zillow as their their lead generator for their places. Uh, so it is a problem um we started using a new company they um they needed a bigger window for cleaning so i used to check out used to be at 11 and um check in used to be at three but that window was too tight for them um uh, because they couldn't make it work so i had to stretch it out to four check in which is cause issues but some they really need it um which it, it works for us. We just have to deal with the guests wanting to check in at three because that's a common check-in time. Um, but yeah, it's a big of a struggle. They, they're on, from our cleaners, like you either go with a company or individual, but if it's an individual, it is much harder to, to like, you're, you're doing logistics at, at points. And if you're not good at logistics, it's not, it's not easy. Um, if you are in that scenario that you have a couple properties, it might be better to go with a company that has the scheduling person that that's their job is just to schedule. They know it's on the dock and they know how quickly it needs to be done. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, so from a tax liability, um, short-term rentals has um a loophole that makes it very beneficial um the the whole law the rule that says that your past your um, long-term rental is passive income um it flips because a uh, short-term rental is never considered passive income you are active member in it um but with that being said the requirements for um real estate professional is a caveat there so basically if you you are the active worker in your airbnb you can use your um the, your the depreciation on your property can now go to your active income, so it's a loophole, and I don't know how long it's gonna stay. It's been it's been in the, the thing it's been in documents for years, so it's not like it's something brand new. It's just the fact that short term rentals have now become more common, and everyone is all interested in it now. But it doesn't have to be the policy that it's your primary focus. It's it's not the same. You need to be the, the one that does the most work for your Airbnb. So if you are basically, if you're working the, the most out of anyone else, then you're okay. Which if you're answering messages and doing stuff like that, you are the most active person. Even if you're still working 40 hours. Yes. So do you just do they actually qualify as a real estate professional? No. Just it's, Airbnb. Well, yeah, so like the short-term rental loophole of uh, running running accommodations for less than thirty days, basically. 
So that's why a lot of people are getting into it because they are able to accelerate depreciation, um, their properties and put it against their active income. So it's, you know, basically you have to show that you are the one that works the most. So you have your cleaners, you have your, your handyman and all these people that are working with you. Um, you just need to show that you are the person that is working the most. Yes. That, yeah, you get, so yeah, you're out the amount of time. So when you're answering messages and things like that, you're you're timing yourself. Um, most of the time, it's not even a, a question. If an Airbnb is running and you're running it and you're not doing it with a company, um, you're going to end up being the person that runs the runs. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you can't depreciate your foreign assets. Sadly, um, it doesn't work that easily. I wish it was. Um, but so the depreciation rules doesn't work on your on those foreign assets at least. So our Mexico property, we own it outright. Um, which because you know, the whole reason why the depreciation and everything works because there's a mortgage on it. With no mortgage means no depreciation against, and it, and it was still. It, it was not a U.S. based mortgage, so they don't see it as the same, and they don't. So, it's, yes. Oh yeah. So that's that's one of the, the sucky things. Go ahead. For uh, Chris's question, what did you have to do in terms of your like home insurance policy? Yes. Um. So if you own property and you turn it into an Airbnb, um, there is um insurance companies that replaces your homeowner's insurance that has a, a rider on it that is meant for your short-term rental side so it, it's a complete replacement to your homeowner's policy yes so it makes the brunt a little bit easier because it's probably gonna be like an extra thousand dollars a year maybe two thousand dollars a year um on well beyond your your normal homeowner's policy it's expensive it's proper it's proper insurance they're they're the one that's the least headaches. Uh, yeah. 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 So with that being said, some people don't own all their properties, they arbitrage. There are companies that um that are out there that are basically when you check in, the insurance starts, when they check out, it stops. And you pay that way, but it's not cheap either. Um, but that's the only way you can make it work as an arbitrage person. Go ahead. If you're running your business that's still in the country, are you still subject to the RSO if not, then you can still get your RSO for the whole year and then you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and you can get your RSO for the whole year and so as a short-term rental with low 30 days, they don't fall into those rules. But if you let them stay for more than 30 days, they, you let them send some mail to your address, you have now fallen into to the, yeah. So you can do it. So that's so that's the, the caveat there. Cause like I said, go to midterm rentals during the winter time. And that is a possibility that someone could do that. I have a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot of technology in my homes. Um so smart locks. Um I am a smart hub person, so I have a smart hub in my house that connects to my locks. Um I like smart the smart hub better because it doesn't drain as much power from my locks. Um, generally, if you have a, a Wi-Fi enabled lock, you probably change your locks, change your batteries maybe every four to six months, um, maybe less than that, to be honest with you. Um, our batteries have been in our short-term rentals for like two years, and I haven't changed the batteries yet, um, just because it's not actively emitting a Wi-Fi signal from the lock itself. Um, basically, our Wi-Fi hub sends it a code, it takes the code, and that's it, and then there's no information going back and forth. Um, so everything's set off of that. So smart thermostats, please get a smart thermostat and please be able to lock it. Um, I had a guest in December, no, January, turn my heating up to 90 degrees and open the window. Um, no, and it did it for like three to four days. Yeah, I, I don't know. So it was terrible. 
So smart locks, so smart um, thermostat makes sense, but you have to be able to lock it to some degree. It's just like you can go in this range, but you can't go to 90. Um, so smart locks, things like that. Um, yes, so we have noise and smoke in the house. So we get alerts when, if someone, someone smokes in the home, including marijuana, including vaping, supposedly. Uh, if someone does any of that, you get a notification. Um, it, it promotes the levels of whatever it is in the air, whatever it's reading. And you can use that as uh, your evidence that someone smoked to do um, claims against. And for noise, um, you set a decibel level. So it's like anything over this decibel level for an extended period of time, I get alerts. And over so many alerts, you give the a possibility of evicting them. Evicting them, just kicking them out. <laughs> There's actually companies in the city that that's their job is to kick people out of Airbnbs. Yeah. Yeah. Say it again. Um. So it's like, obviously, there are noises that happen in the house, and it just random noises. And it's like in inside the property, we have it like in our kitchen because that's the easiest way there. Um, like your dishwasher runs, that's fine. It doesn't recognize that. But if you turn on the radio and have it running for more than 10 minutes, I get a notification um, that it's been going on. Um, or I get a notification saying that the, the fire alarm has been going off for an extended period of time, stuff like that. So it is it's definitely like you set it to what your threshold you want it to be. Um, I would say go inside of Airbnb, put up, set this thing up, and then turn up something that is loud, that you believe is loud, and let it run and see what decibel level this, the, this system is saying this is at. And then set that as your threshold. Anything, anything above that is you've gone too far. Right. So we talk about scale. Okay. Yeah. So are you looking at different market or you looking at like I will say that there's some ideas on the table that will put as an Airbnb park. Uh, it is like a, a 20, 20 Airbnbs on like 20 acres of land. And it's meant to be like a full on park. Um, beyond that piece, that will be a large amount of our focus will be that to that uh, is we're spread out. Like once you systematize it enough, you don't really like you do have to start the team over again, but it's not as hard as you think it is to find your team. Uh, so we were able to find someone in a new market. Uh, a new reason for me to want to go somewhere, especially if I needed to diversify my portfolio. Like it's cheaper in the north of the United States, but it's also seasonal in the north of the United States. So you have to start to spread out on the south to Texas and stuff like that to to make your your portfolio make sense. And so you're not you're not eating beans on in January, but you're eating lobster in July. Yes. Um, yes, the furnishings, that's the interesting piece. Um, uh, we figured out a few ways to get our, our purchasing needs down, but it's only in the Chicago market. Um, so a struggle with the fact that I, like, we're literally talking about getting a place in Pittsburgh, like probably in the next month or so. Um, but we have all inventory here, but the place is in Pittsburgh. So now we got to get inventory there. And if I go straight to Pittsburgh to buy there, my, my budget triples, if not more than triples. So it's like, what do I do? <laughs> to be honest, you just get a, a task rabbit to drive your stuff across states, uh, which is the thing to do. Um, and it's still cheaper. Like our, our like generally to, to, to run a, to furnish a two bedroom apartment as an Airbnb costs between 10 to 15 K. Um, We've pushed our numbers down to three. Uh, yeah. Got to know the right people. <laughs> oh, yeah. We we have, we, we're, it's getting to the point we might need a warehouse. Um, but we have, we have inventory galore in our house now. But, um, and we can keep buying it. And it's like, I just need to have somewhere to put it. So we should be cleaning out the basements in the next few, next, next week, actually. Um, so we, we just, we just, we just got an arbitrage unit in the city. Um, it's our first arbitrage, so it's that's even new to us. 
Uh, so we, I, I found a five unit building, five unit plus building. And instead of me purchasing it, I'm just renting out one of the rooms and the landlord is okay with me doing Airbnb in that unit. Um, it's a three bedroom, two bathroom apartment and it's two and a half bathroom apartment in the city. And um, it works. That's the easiest way to get in. And it's all, it's all a cash flow play. Like when you purchase is, is it can be like a long-term appreciation play, but this is just pure cash flow. No, I actually got him down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was about a month and a half, and that's why he came down. His numbers were very high. I think he wanted like thirty eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> okay. No. He. Yeah, he he gets the rent, and that's it. Um, there are people that I know that do profit sharing. Um, I would not advise it if you can get away with that, um, because you can be giving them like a substantial amount of money. I mean, they you can be giving them five, six thousand dollars a month, some months. Right. Uh, the business names. Right. Uh yes. So you uh we we put a, a into the documentation. I make sure you put in that if there's anything any for any reason that I can't rent this out on Airbnb, that Airbnb won't issue me a license, I will break the lease. So 30 day notice break. So just no. oh. Yeah, so I I had that same issue, and I made sure that that was covered. Um, our properties, we when we looked at them, we looked at them with that lens to like can an Airbnb guest get in and out without disturbing anyone else. Um, so that was a part of the criteria we looked for. But definitely, there's there are there are homes where it's a, a five unit on top and in the basement unit is a side entrance that doesn't come in contact with the main building. And you just, they come in and out that side door and they don't come in contact with anyone else. Um, one of the properties has a backyard. Um, the Airbnb guest doesn't have access to the backyard at all. So we don't put in a listing. So don't even attempt to go back there because you tell your tenants like the backyard is yours. No one else will be back here as like a short term rental person. Um, I need to take home at least 1500 bucks a month. Um, and that's it is at the low. Um, that's the, as far as far down I'm willing to go, but the places that we're looking at now, like the take home, it's probably around 3k a month after rent. Um, like I said, I have my own ways, so that makes that a little bit more complicated. But I will say, if you are doing it, yeah, you're gonna end up paying about ten k. Yeah. So yeah, it includes a lot. Anyway. Yeah. Um, not as hard as you think it is, especially if you have a place that is a touristy place in the first place. Um, it's not that hard to get a manager if you need a manager any the physical person there. If it's like a a condo building that has other Airbnbs in the building, or or it's just a a place that is tourist fo focused in general. Um, so it's not too terrible. Going there is always the easiest route, but um, there's places online that you can find a property manager basically anywhere. Um, like on a normal basis, I see people that are arbitraging in Mexico a lot, actually, and then Argentina, Colombia, the whole nine. So there's property managers everywhere. If you have something out of the country that you are looking to find a management company for, what would you what are the things that you look for and what is like the profit or the cost, I guess, for that? Um, it depends on how much you want to be involved. Do you want a property manager that does the full process? He talks with guests, he greets the guests, he makes sure the place is clean. He has also have the handyman on staff. Um, 
you're probably going to pay him 20 to 25 percent um which can hurt in some scenarios um if you are partly you want a part target a property manager he's going to just deal with the cleanings and the handyman you can probably get it down to 10 percent um and that's not too bad but you're doing the communication with the guests and stuff like that which is not hard once you have the systems in place <laughs> I mean, a true notion in probably like four hours a week or less. Um, and that, that four hours is just a spaz out 20 minutes. That's like, crap, someone came early uh, or, the, or something happened with the locks or the, the internet went out or something happened and making sure of that. And it's like communicating for the next 20 minutes with the guests and then that's it. Yeah. Yes, I have a few. Um, um, I would say the person that left the window open was one of the one of the people. Um, there was I had a smoker. This person was not that bright. Um, she smoked in the house. Obviously, there's no smoking policy. I had a guest coming in the next, the same the same day. Um, they smoked and. I initially messaged Airbnb. It's like, well, I messaged her directly because like we have monitors. And so we knew that you were smoking. And she's like, okay, I'll stop smoking. Like, cool, thanks. Um, and then I start, I charged for extra cleaning. And then she contacted Airbnb saying that um, I didn't smoke in the house. I, I didn't smoke in the house. When he told me to stop, I stopped. I'm like, but you saying that you smoke in the house. <laughs> So Airbnb pushed back, but I'm like, she, I don't need to give you evidence. She just told on herself. <laughs> but like, I to, it took like a week or two to get Airbnb to pay me back for that, um, for extra cleaning and things like that. But that guess, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was another guess? The Mexico guess. Um, our Mexico guess, she, she came in for like a week. Um, she wanted her money back. So as soon as she walked in the door, it was problems. She was like, something's broken. This is not right. She said that the, the bed was broken. She sent me a photo. She like took the slats out and took a photo of like the bed being broken. Uh, we had a handyman come over and he's like, that's impossible. Like, that's like, it's not broken. That's absolutely not how that would work. Like she, she just disassembled the bed and then try to get money back. So you will get guests that are actively trying to, to get their money back. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um. So our my meetup is every third Thursday of the month. Um. Our, our next subject is your tech stack. So all the systems that you should have in place. Um, and it's the next one is August 17th, I wanna say. I think that's a Thursday. Um, and it's reoccurring and it's at A&N Mortgage. So um, most people know A&N. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> they're hosting everything. Um, but I, I guess need to talk to Landon about that too. Oh yes, oh that's, that is my info actually. So you, that's that QR code is to my direct info. Um, but if you click on the, our website, it's Roman Rome Spaces. You can go to to STR Meetup. It's in the um, it's in the header. Yes, it's monthly. We also have online. So we should be starting. So this setup, I should be getting to that in the future because I don't. I need to to start doing online because not everyone can be there on the Thursday. Like you guys, like I'm always busy on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Nothing else. Yeah. What's up, everybody? I'm Ben Sussman. I help this amazing team run this awesome meetup. Super quick ask for y'all. I mean, a like y'all could see, Dytron is amazing. The real deal gave so much value to y'all. The number one way you can add value to this meetup is tell your friends, your family, your uncle, your dog, your cousin. 
tell as many people as you know about this meetup just because Windy City REI's goal is to help as many people be financially literate, build wealth, understand real estate. So the more people you can tell about this, the more value this club can bring to as many people, the more we're doing our mission and helping people. So please, please tell as many people as you know about this meetup anyway. And Round of applause for Dai Chan. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I know. All right, everybody, give it up for Dytron. All right, so we're going to go ahead and transition to our networking. Before we get started, we'll do our, uh, our monthly picture. Um, for those of you who are interested in new development, we have Jenny Berger from the Property People coming to us next month, and we're going to be doing an interview style Q and A on her experience. Um, she, I think, she just completed what's it, six or four or six unit condo development here in Avondale, and um, I'm sure she has a lot of learning experiences that she can she can share with us. So, um, if new development is something that, that you're interested, in, make sure you come on to our next meetup uh, end of next month. All right, guys, thanks again for coming. We'll go ahead and. Um, Everybody gather around over there and we'll get a group picture. Stop share. Stop share. And then the down arrow, I think. Oh, I don't know where it went. Uh, stop, uh, stop recording. recording.